Hi everyone, welcome to another course from BitGuide, Econ02 Monetary History Part 1. My name is Sina, I'm a professor of business and a co-founder at BitGuide. If you haven't already, please uh, check our courses page on the website and especially uh, watch the Econ 01 What is Money course, which is going to be a prerequisite for this course. So we will cover primitive forms of money, collectibles, base metals, precious metals, modern coinage, and uh, move on to fiat and Bitcoin later. Over the last 10,000 years, money has changed considerably. We have tried many things that failed and have converged to uh, different forms of money over time based on our ex experience. So people have tried commodities, useful items, collectibles, like live animals, food, uh, seashells and stones. Others have tried tools. In some cases, people have used alcohol and cigarettes as money. Uh, but over time, we have converged towards coins, and later paper money, and later in electronic money, and much more recently, Bitcoin. So let's start from primitive money. Early human civilizations used livestock as a form of money. Around 9,000 to 6,000 BC, uh, cows, sheep, camels, they were common forms of money. They were productive assets that er everyone valued, and their livelihood depended on it. So if you wanted to buy something, offering livestock was always accepted as payment. So this was a very useful invention uh, to facilitate trade between people in, in that sort of society, but it wasn't without its limitations. Obviously, uh, fungibility would be a big problem here if you want to compare two cows in, in terms of their monetary values. It would be extremely difficult because everyone is different in terms of age, health, and other factors. So uh, comparability between uh, pieces of money would be hard. Obviously, livestock is not divisible. You can't offer half a cow for payment. Transportation was also a big problem. If you wanted to travel for trade, uh, you have to t take your money with you. And if your money is livestock, your ability to, do, to move and transport for trade is as fast as you can uh, move with your livestock. So, so this wasn't an ideal form of money, but it was the best people could do at the time. With the advent of agriculture, people gradually moved towards using grains as money. Uh, grains and other vegetables or plant products you were used as money in many cultures. So grains have certain advantages over livestock. They are much more fungible. Two piece, two bags of rice are more or less comparable, especially if you're you're growing them in the same region. Uh, transportation is a lot easier. Uh, it's divisible, so you can cut a bag in, into half. However, it's not durable, so you can't really keep that. Uh, keep your money for several months without it uh, starting to rot. So as soon as you received grains as money, uh, value would drain out of it, would leak out of it over time. In addition, grains are not really dense in value. So if you really had a big trade, the amount of grain you needed to exchange was uh, too large. In addition, grains are not scarce really good weather or certain other innovations in agriculture could lead to a significant increase in the supply of grains. And then everybody else who is holding a lot of that as, as a store of value would see their purchasing power collapse. And there's also a more fundamental problem with using food as money, and that is monetizing anything that has other uses would interfere with those uses, especially when demand for money grows. Uh, generally, anything that's chosen as money suddenly experiences a surge in demand, which makes it very expensive and valuable. And as a result, uh, people who used to buy it at cheaper, more affordable prices would not be able to do so anymore. Uh, you experience the same thing today with housing, because houses are not necessarily bought for uh, living, but also um, significantly and increasingly bought for uh, an investment, you see their price skyrocketing and a lot of people are actually being priced out by the investors. Given some of these problems, 
the human society over time realized that maybe we should use something else that's that doesn't have limitations in terms of durability or scarcity and all. So they, they started to use collectibles. Around 1200 BC, we are starting to see humans using cowrie shells as money first observed in China, and it beca became the most widely used and the longest used form of currency in history. So these are shells of marine mollusk that have a very unique shape. They are very difficult to uh, copy and counterfeit. Uh, they're durable, they're scarce, easily transportable, very lightweight. So they have lots of good properties to be used as money. They were available in shallow waters of the Pacific and Indian Ocean. And uh, they also had ornamental use at the time. So naturally, people viewed them as valuable items. And this paved the way uh, to create consensus in the society as, as something valuable um, to be used as money. But there were also other collectibles that humans uh, adopted over time. Animal teeth uh, is one of the more common ones. Uh, jewelry, bronze rings that you can see in the bottom. Uh, if you want to uh, take a deeper dive there, I, I recommend you reading the Shelling Out article by Nick Zabo. Believe it or not, animal teeth is still used today as, as money. In Solomon Islands, northeast of Australia, dolphin teeth uh, is used as currency, and they actually love it. And economic rules worked just fine for this form of money, too. It was being used as alternative to fiat money. And during the great financial crisis, when mainstream currencies suffered losses, the dolphin tooth increased in value fivefold. As a result, you can expect that a lot of people got interested in killing more and more dolphins to get the teeth, which brought lots of criticisms from animal conservationists. Uh, one of the responses from a dolphin hunter was, uh, the reason we don't use fiat is the white man's money will end, but the dolphin teeth will always be there for us. What's interesting about this statement is despite the uh, disaster that's happening for dolphins, the hunter naturally realizes the risks that are involved in using money that can be manipulated. People have also used stones as money. Ray stones are very famous for their use in the Yap Islands. These were limestones, gigantic donut shaped. And generally you would find them lying around in a village like this. They didn't even have to be exchanged. And people naturally knew who owns which stone. So this is very interesting and significant because this is probably one of the first examples where we can find that money doesn't have to be useful. What do I mean by that? Money doesn't have to be something especially beautiful or especially valuable in day-to-day -to -day life or have any other use for you, right? When we were talking about food or, or talking about beautiful collectibles, they always had this other kind of use and then the, 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 the commodity or that product turned into money later on. In this case, it's just a piece of stone. It's not necessarily beautiful or it's not usable or even movable. Uh, it, it just functions as an accounting uh, instrument. These stones were immobile. People just remembered who owned what. And exchanges were interestingly verbal. So uh, this is also probably one of the first examples we can find where uh, people verbally make exchanges. It's just a memory update. There is no money being exchanged. So this also expands our understanding of money. It doesn't necessarily have to be something physical we move. It could be in the thought space. It doesn't have to be present at all. Again, going back to the idea of credit, uh, a simple promise could be money, right? So a, an interesting example here was when they were acquiring some, some new stones and they had to transport them by sea to the village. Uh, in one of the trips, they run into an accident. The stone falls in the sea and lost. But when they come back to the village, villagers agree that this stone was collected fair and square. So the person who had owned it previously still owns it. Even though it exists in the bottom of the ocean, it still represents the wealth of this person. So that stone in the bottom of the ocean 
were still used by for many, many decades later as money and people traded based on that. In other words, this example tells us that money in essence is a trustworthy accounting system. There's nothing physical that's relevant here or needed here. This was also noted by Milton Friedman in a paper from 1991. He wrote, the YAP system of immobile money was not so different from the operation of the gold vault of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which can pay gold from one government to another without the gold ever leaving the vault. So he realizes the similarity between the YAP system of using uh, stones just as symbols of money and exchanging verbally really resembles the modern uh, monetary system where we just have reserves for just creation of some psychological benefit but the actual money is ledger entries on bank databases as we move forward in history we start to realize people gravitated towards the use of base metals as money so uh, these could include bronze and copper uh, forms Around 1000 BC, we start to, to find bronze and copper cowrie imitations in China. These cowrie imitations later evolved into tools like, like knives and spades made out of these base metals. They, they also commonly had a hole in them so that you can um, connect them together in a chain and build a stack of money. So in the bottom, you can see these tools with these holes at the end that allowed uh, easy storage of the, uh, of the form of money. And later you can realize this, uh, they, 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 they understood that the tool part doesn't really matter. So let's stay with just the, the round shape here with, with a hole in the middle, uh, which is starting to resemble the modern coinage. So this form of uh, base metal money or base metal coin became really, really popular in China and lasted for a long time. But base metals also had their own problems, namely the uh, stock to flow. Uh, if you're using copper, for instance, as, uh, as a form of money and you're making uh, coins out of it, uh, it is really possible to find a huge buying of copper and suddenly flood a society with newly found copper this will lead to debasement of everybody else's coins and distort the financial system uh, in, in one way if you found a significant amount of the metal that's being used as money then you can buy up the whole society that is using that metal as money so it's really important to use dependable forms of metal that uh, whose supply cannot suddenly change so there was a dire need for a form of money that is highly dependable and whose supply cannot experience significant fluctuations. And that brings us to gold and silver. After tens of thousands of years using various monies, humans eventually settled on gold and silver. Originally, these were pieces of jewelry that were used for ornamental value. Uh, and, and gold and silver were universally known to be precious. And the reason for that is partly because of the looks and partly because of the trust that was gained over the millennia in these items being able to keep their value. And that comes from an important economic feature they have. It's hard to mine them. It's hard to fly, flood the market with extra units of these items in a short amount of time. And realization of this feature, in other words, high stock to flow caused people to start trusting this metal these metals as a form of money they were dense in value hard to forge and scarce also easy to transport for the same reason stealing them was also really easy lots of wars happened for robbing somebody else's gold or silver but this was still not an ideal form of money it had uh, a series of challenges. Uh, if you pay somebody with a bullion or a piece of jewelry uh, to determine the value of that item, you had to weigh it and test it for purity. And you will run into fungibility issues. How could you compare two different pieces of jewelry? They're all different in terms of size and weight and maybe content. 
So it becomes time consuming and maybe unreliable to use these items as, as money unless you uh, have no other choice or better technology available. So this these challenges in accepting this form of money can create friction in trade and hamper trade and economic growth. Imagine trying to pay someone with just raw pieces of gold and the other party would have a big problem now trying to figure out if it's really gold, how big is that, and so forth. That's why over time people moved away from using pieces of gold or silver as money and moved towards modern coinage. One of the first examples of using precious metals as money is the stator, which was found first in 700 BC in ancient Lydia. The stator was just a blob of metal, gold and silver, with basic stamp. And that little stamp made a big difference in its usability as money. Anything that had the stamp on it, you would immediately know that this is pure, this is legit, and it represents this much value because... Uh, these, this state coined it that way. Uh, and these stamps soon evolved into beautiful works of art. Uh, they started to use uh, a Greek uh, mythology and the images of the gods and emperors on, the, on these coins. And Stator was actually not a single coin. Lydia consisted of several cities, each having their own coin and stamp, collectively called the Stator. Uh, the typical coin was 16 grams of gold, but designs varied a lot and sometimes annually, depending on what becomes important in that city or in that society. Uh, sometimes it was cult cultural events, sometimes it was religious events, or sometimes it was something that a king wanted to uh, popularize or make people aware of. So here are actual examples of the coins uh, found from uh, that era. These are, these are from around 500 BC. And you can see the image of a lion facing a bull. Invention of the coin was a significant monumental innovation in monetary technology. Because as I said, it solved a lot of problems for us. We uh, had that stamp on a piece of precious metal solved the problem of fungibility, uh, trustworthiness, and uh, measurement. A king could say that this image on this much of coin would represent this much value. And uh, as long as they take sufficient precautionary measures against counterfeiting, anyone who gets a coin with that sign would well, automatically know that this is fungible with any other coin, the same sign, and they're worth this much, and uh, they're pure and legit. So this technology got quickly got copied by the Greek, the Persians, Macedonians, and later the Roman Empire. Unlike the Chinese coins, which depended on base metals, these new coins based on precious metals proved to be much better monetary instruments. So to recap, the transition towards precious metal coins was a very significant technological innovation in money. It eliminated the need to weigh and test the purity of each piece of metal every time you make a transaction. So this can lead to a remarkable increase in, in the velocity of money and allow trade to happen at a much more uh, faster frequency. They were based on proven precious metals that were globally known to be trustworthy and valuable. Uh, they were also chemically durable and uh, rare in terms of their supply. So if you hold, if you hold a lot of uh, uh, gold, you would be confident that your holding would not be debased. The coins were also fungible and interchangeable. Even if two coins were not exactly the same in terms of the shape and weight, the fact that they had the same stamp would mean that they have the same value. So this immediately solved the fungibility problem as we discussed. Let's dive deeper into the idea of fungibility. To give a formal definition, fungible items have equal and undifferentiated value between them. For example, two $1 bills. One might be really worn out or even cut at the edges or have some other blemishes and problems, but we generally consider them uh, equals. So uh, there's no discount or anything that wear and tear would uh, uh, justify on one of the bills. They're completely comparable and interchangeable, and that facilitates uh, trade and eliminates all the guesswork about the value of this item. Similarly, creating coins out of blobs of metal would allow us to 
uh, achieve fungibility. Even though every coin is going to be different, you pick a bunch of them and each is going to be slightly different. Maybe even the weights and shapes are not exactly comparable. But uh, by convention and by agreement, we all say that anything that has this kind of sign on, on top of it and it's a legit coin is going to have the same value. So coins from the same mint would all be identical. And this uh, eliminates the burdensome measurement process for everyday transaction, and increases monetary velocity, ability to trade, improves uh, an economy's capacity to grow. As a result, coins are the perfect accounting denominations, allowing societies the powerful tools of being able to measure everything in one unit. Coins are divisible, even though a single coin cannot be broken down, but you can have a combination of the small and large coins to come up with any value you want to exchange. So in effect, they are divisible and they are difficult to forge because the power of the mint and the government that's responsible for the money would be behind it and, and to prosecute uh, counterfeiters. So that creates some trust, but also the engravings were uh, difficult to mimic. So uh, the combination of these provides the trust that a monetary system needed. Obviously not ideal, but, but good enough to form the foundation of global trade. But pretty much like every other technology, humans quickly realize how they can manipulate and misuse the innovation in a way that benefits them at the expense of others. So uh, coins started to become corrupted uh, over time. Rulers loved immortalizing themselves and minting coins in their names engraved with their faces. But more importantly, coin mints gave governments influence over money. It gave them really monetary superpowers. Anytime their accounting didn't work, they didn't have to uh, go through the hard work of finding new sources of money and, and uh, improve the output. They could simply benefit from seniorage. Seniorage is the profit from issuing money. In other words, it's the face value of coins minus the production cost. If you find a way to cheaply produce more coins, which we will get to later, you can uh, effectively create uh, significant wealth for yourself, but you haven't really created new wealth for the society. So what happens is simply a shift of wealth, not creation of wealth. In other words, that's debasement and dilution of money. All right, now let's uh, talk about this, the history and the story of denarius. This is a famous uh, coin from the Roman Empire. It was minted in the early days of Roman Empire, first century AD, and the plural form is denarii. It was used in the first 220 years of the empire, adopted across Europe, Asia, Africa, and approximately it was worth a day's worth of uh, labor. It was made out of silver, it was really high purity, 4.5 grams of pure silver was in the first version. So here are some images of uh, denarii found over the ages. Uh, on top, you can see a denarius from 44 BC showing Julius Caesar on the obverse and the goddess Venus on the reverse. In the bottom, you see a coin minted in 18 BC with Caesar Augustus uh, image on it. So like we said, government started to realize that they can manipulate money to their own benefits. They were unable to resist the temptation to create free money for themselves, and frankly, who wouldn't? So because the supply of silver was limited, they couldn't mine more of it. As we discussed before, they came up with another trick to create new coins, which was basically uh, debasing the money and reducing the purity. You can see that the early versions of the coin had up to 90% silver, and over time it went down to 50% and even lower. By decreasing the purity of the coin, the governments were able to make more silver for themselves without really having to mine more and more uh, silver, which was increasingly difficult. And that made uh, financing challenging for uh, expansions that they had in mind. And uh, this allowed governments to uh, do away with discipline and take on more projects than they could afford. So here's a striking chart showing the debasement over time of this Roman coin. In the Augustus Caesar's time, the coin was 98% pure. By Marcus Aurelius's time, it was only 80% pure. By the third century, an emperor called Caracalla 
uh, found a more innovative way of debasement. He introduced a coin that was worth double. So it was called double denarius, but it only had 50% more silver in it. In other words, uh, this also represented a 60% debasement compared to the original version of the coin. And you can continue this trend all the way. Um, a lot of things happened, but the constant factor was the debasement of money. And by the Galenius's time in the later third century, uh, the coin was only 5% pure. Towards the end of this period, the coin has effectively become uh, worthless. It, it had a bronze core and a thin silver coating around it. And this significant period of debasement also corresponded with uh, the crisis of the th third century, a period in which several emperors were assassinated and the Roman Empire almost collapsed. So internal economic problems and the dawn of empires are generally uh, accompanied by debasement of the money. So as this was happening, a new coin emerged, which was called Solidus. And while the empire was crumbling due to external battles and internal political instability, Constantine the Great started a series of reforms, including minting a new coin, Solidus, in 312 AD, which was composed of relatively solid gold, about 4.5 grams of gold per coin. Below you can see the image of one of the first coins. Here's, an, here's a map of the Roman Empire in the year 395, where you can see the division between the west and east side. A few decades later, the Western Roman Empire fell, uh, and Byzantine Empire grew out of it in the east, and they adopted Solidus. They continued minting it in Constantinople. Solidus resisted debasement for a long time, but ultimately, emperors figured it out, particularly when Michael IV the Papagonian assumed the throne in the year 1034 and began the slow process of debasing. Debasing was gradual at first, but then accelerated rapidly. By the year 1042, purity was down to 87%, then 75, then 66, 58, 33. And somewhere in the late 11th century and early 12th century, Solidus got discontinued and new coinage replaced it. As you can see from these two examples, over time, currency devaluation became a persistent norm throughout the world. Once governments discovered uh, this monetary superpower, they used it to the end until the coin got completely destroyed and then started over with something new, which they can debase over and over again. And this continued until Florin appeared, which was a coin in the 13th century Florence. Florin is also known as the Renaissance money, the money that supported the social and economic movements in the Renaissance era. Let's take a quick look at uh, Florence in that time. It was the birthplace of Renaissance, and it, was, it consisted uh, of a bunch of smaller city-states in what we know today as Italy. It was the center of medieval European trade and finance at the time, and a major artistic, cultural, political, and economic hub. It was one of the wealthiest cities in that era. In 1252, the Florentine Mint struck the first gold florin. Uh, on the right, you can see how it looked, and they had engravings of their flag on the coin. Florin did the impossible. For decades and centuries, its purity level stayed the same. Gold weight inside it remained unchanged. And this gave it reputation, credibility, and trust. Even though precious metal coins were durable, divisible, and portable, but they were susceptible to government debasement and breach of the trust. As a result, no coin really existed with widespread credibility because before it can really achieve global acceptance, people discovered how to debase it and destroy the coin. But Florian changed this trend. It earned a reputation that eventually drove all those surrounding it into its denomination. Basically, as one coin becomes more and more trustworthy, it makes no sense for people in that region to use some other coin. Too many coins only creates confusion and complexity and friction in trade. And this is also known as the network effect. 
uh, money essentially is a network. And the more people use a form of money, the more valuable it becomes. And therefore, the more attractive it is to newcomers. So as it grows, it becomes more powerful and even more uh, able to absorb monetary value from all, the, all other kinds of uh, money that are out there. So over time, money tends to converge to one. Formation of this new trustworthy money also coincided with advancements in mathematics, accounting, banking, uh, during the Renaissance era, and these co the combination of these allowed flooring to become the bedrock of uh, the new monetary world until we get to the gold standard era in late 19th century. So let me uh, take a moment here and explain in more depth how is it that better money allows for better eco economic growth? How is it that good money drives social progress? So the first thing I would mention is uh, goods, the flow of goods in an economy is less than flow of the money. What do, what do I mean by that? So when you think about a supply chain, generally, you see a flow of material from the producers to the customers. And maybe sometimes there are several producers along the way, each doing something. And ultimately, raw material gets converted into more and more valuable products that could be sold to the market. So there's a flow of products and flow of material from upstream to downstream. But there is a reverse flow that's happening in supply chains, which is the financial flow. Money flows from the customer to the maybe the retailer and then to the manufacturer and to the suppliers and so forth. So money goes the other way. For every uh, In every step of the way, before goods can flow through the system, money should flow because everyone demands payment for their services. Uh, naturally, if your money works well, you don't even feel um, any problem with the money. It just works and it facilitates trade. So the only challenge you have is to make sure goods are flowing properly to the market. But if your money doesn't work properly, if it's too slow, if it has issues, if it has friction, it will itself become a constraint on the manufacturing and on the supply chain side. So a slow money movement hampers trade and economic growth. So one way to put it is the, the, the efficiency of the monetary system places a constraint on the economic growth. In other words, flow of goods less than flow of money. So naturally, to achieve maximum economic output, you want to maximize the flow of money. You want money that's frictionless, easy to move. It has high velocity. Velocity is defined as how quickly money changes hands. And one of the factors limiting velocity is the transportation cost. If money is heavy, then essentially long distance trade becomes impossible. As we discovered dense forms of money like gold and silver coins, they became easier to move and we were able to do more trade with one another. Um, but velocity is not necessarily hampered by uh, transportation. Uh, other factors such as trust or even verification could introduce friction in the system. And all of these frictions eventually lead to hampering economic progress. So you can think about the supply chains and the trade routes that existed in that era. You can see uh, uh, we are starting to, to see truly global trade in the 13th to the 15th century. And this level of inter this level of connection between nations and societies required really, really good money to work. If every region had their own coin, they had to then barter them. And then uh, some people would reject accepting some other people's coin because they are moving into a different geography where that coin is not acceptable. All of these would introduce uh, challenges and frictions into the trade. So over time, as you want to grow, as you want to do more global trade, you have to have a single monetary system. But this didn't happen over time. As international trade grew, thousands of competing coins were used. Uh, they had different standards for weight and purity, and, and they were not necessarily fungible. Equivalency conversion was difficult. You had to know how many, what, what is the conversion rate between all these different types. Every single transaction between geographies needed a conversion. Ultimately, this caused slow money, low velocity, and more constraint over trade. So this is sometimes called coin multiplicity. When you have a variety of different coins, you will end up having to barter those coins and each of them being really different. Again, you're back in square one. 
and you really haven't solved the monetary problem. One of the first solutions to the coin multiplicity issue was emergence of a profession named uh, money changer. So these people have specialized in this uh, requisite conversion and became integral to all trade. So anytime you wanted to trade with someone that's using a different kind of money, you could go to these money changers and switch uh, your, your denomination uh, and, and get the money that the other person would accept. But as you can see, this step itself is problematic and uh, introduces unnecessary costs in the system. So over time, people realize that instead of going to these money changers and spend some money there uh, to trend, to convert my money to this other type of money, why don't we use the same money all? And this goes back to the idea of money being a network, in fact. So uh, all the people who are using a, a form of money form one network, and there could be other people using other forms of money um, forming other networks. But the important thing is the bigger network becomes more and more valuable compared to the smaller network. So over time, it absorbs more and more users of the smaller network because everyone will be just better off if they're on the same network. It's going to be much more efficient. But anytime you don't see a singular monetary network, you should look for barriers. There are certain artificial barriers that are placed on top of the free market and they cause different coins to survive. For example, today we have uh, one fiat money for every country, but this system is artificially propped up by government force and the power of violence. Otherwise, it's a lot more efficient for the globe to use the same money. And it is in this context that euro dollar has emerged to, per to perform the functions of the global reserve currency. So coins solved a lot of problems for us, including uh, density of value and ease of transportation, which also made them easy to steal. As a result, transporting coins across geographies involved safety and security challenges, which brings uh, their own costs to the trade. That's it for this course. In the next one, we will follow up with the evolution of the credit system, uh, fiat money, and the complicated uh, layer two and layer three parts of the modern monetary system and ultimately Bitcoin.